Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Nero Jasani, fellow at East Carolina University. Uh, the Journal Club article that I'm going to talk about is on the topic of ultrafiltration in decompensated heart failure with cardiorenal syndrome. The current trial that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, the CARES Heart Failure Trial. Ultrafiltration is thought to be a therapeutic alternative to the co conventional treatment of diuretics. In patients who are resistant to diuretic treatment, especially with acute decompensated heart failure, and more so for congestive symptoms relief. The mechanism of acute cardiorenal syndrome is not 100% or very well understood, but there are few players which can have some role in the pathophysiology of acute cardiorenal syndrome extrarenal hemodynamic changes, neurohormonal activation and activation of sympathetic system, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, and so forth. Intrarenal microvascular and cellular dysregulation can play a role, and so does the oxidative stress. At times, overzealous use of intravenous diuretics can also lead to worsening of renal function and precipitation of acute cardiorenal syndrome. Ultrafiltration carries the advantage of greater control over the rate and volume of fluid removed. There is a greater natriuresis, in fact the right word would be greater net sodium loss, loss less neurohormonal activation, and these are all the potential physiological advantages of ultrafiltration. The Caress Heart Failure Study the cardiorenal rescue study in acute decompensated heart failure, the current study under discussion, was devised to compare the effect of ultrafiltration with stepped pharmacologic therapy on renal function and weight loss in patients with heart failure who have worsening renal function and persistent congestion. It was a randomized multicenter trial. It was not a blended study. The participants were the patients from 22 sites in US and the Canada. The patient eligib eligibility criteria included worsened renal function within 12 weeks before the index admission or within 10 days after the index admission for heart failure. The rise in serum creatinine was at least 0.3 mg per deciliter. All the patients were required to have at least two of the following which includes 2 plus peripheral edema, jugular venous pressure greater than 10 centimeters of water, pulmonary edema or pleural effusion on chest x-ray. If we refine the eligibility criteria in the supplementary section, the patient should have been must be 18 years or older and the patient should be primarily admitted to the hospital with diagnosis of decompensated heart failure and the onset of cardiorenal syndrome should have happened within 12 weeks before the index hospitalization or within 10 days after that admission. Patients should have persistent volume overload. If those patients had a Schwann-Gans monitor, then the pulmonary artery catheter should display a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure more than 22 millimeters or one and one of the following criteria which includes 2 plus peripheral edema or radiological findings of pulmonary edema or pleural effusions. For those patients who did not have pulmonary artery catheter, the researchers included two of the following criteria which includes 2 plus peripheral edema or a JVP greater than 10 centimeters of water or pulmonary edema or pleural effusions on chest x-ray. Two of any of these three criteria. The exclusion criteria includes intravascular volume depletion based on the investigator's clinical assessment, acute coronary syndrome within four weeks, indications for hemodialysis, creatinine more than 3.5 milligrams per deciliter at admission, systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, 
alternative explanation for worsening renal function such as obstructive uropathy, other reasons for renal injury like contrast-induced nephropathy or ATN, hematocrite more than 45%, poor venous access, clinical instability which needed use of intravenous vasoactive drugs, vasodilators and or inotropes, allergy or contraindications to the use of heparin, known bilateral renal artery stenosis, complex congenital heart disease, valvular heart disease, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and so forth. Sepsis and ongoing infection was an exclusion criteria and the patients who were enrolled in other different studies or device based interventions were also excluded. The primary endpoint integrated two different outcomes in in a single display and this was a bivariate primary endpoint which included change in serum creatinine and change in weight considered simultaneously. The secondary endpoints, the major players in the secondary endpoints was the rate of clinical decongestion means as reflected by JVP less than 8 centimeters of water or no more than trace peripheral edema and absence of orthopnea. Measures of global well-being and dyspnea was also included. It was a visual analog scale that carried points from 0 to 100. Patients with higher points means they are less short of breath and they have less factors affecting their global, global well-being. This is a list of secondary endpoints that were studied. A composite of serum creatinine and weight loss at days 1 and 3 and at 1 week. Weight loss and renal improvement assessed at 96 hours and 1 week. Treatment failure during the first 7 days after randomization. Changes in electrolytes. Changes in weight. Total net fluid loss and changes in biomarkers like NT, Pro, BNP and again global assessment and visual analog scores from enrollment to 96 hours and at one week length of hospital stay, uh, re-hospitalization for heart failure, office visits and unscheduled emergency department visits for any reasons, change in dose of oral diuretics, resource utilization as described by use of hospitalization, use of disposables con consumed by the ultrafiltration intervention. And although in the final refined article all these things are not 100% displayed, but these all things were studied. For the ultrafiltration group, the loop diuretics were discontinued for the duration of therapy. The ultrafiltration was done by Aquadex System 100 and the fluid was removed at a rate of 200 milliliters per hour. Addition of IV vasodilators or positive inotropic agents after randomization was prohibited unless it was deemed very necessary. This is a overall description of the stepped pharmacological care arm. The desired urine output was 3 to 5 liters per day. Patients were stratified based on the different diuretics regime they were using. No matter what diuretics they used, the loop diuretic dose was displayed in form of furosemide equivalent, oral furosemide equivalent. If the patient had output of more than 5 liters per day, then if deemed necessary by the clinician, the dose of diuretics was reduced and if the output was less than 3 then there was a step up in the pharmacological therapy. At 24 hours the same pattern was observed. At 48 hours if your output remained less than 3 liters per day then the patients were advanced to the next step of higher dose of diuretics or combination of diuretic, loop diuretics and thiazide type diuretics and if the patient still did not meet the desired output, then inotropic agents or vasodilators were added depending on their systolic blood pressure and ejection fraction. 
same principle was applied at 72 hours but this time if inotropes or vasodilators did not lead to desired outcome then the patients were either switched to hemodynamic guided therapy or use of left ventricular assist device dialysis or ultrafiltration crossover the baseline characteristics of the patients in the two groups was fairly similar with regards to age male sex caucasian or white race the median weight was 234 pounds in the pharmacologic therapy and 207 pounds in the ultrafiltration group the systolic function was almost similar in the two groups the ejection fraction the median was 35 percent in the pharmacologic therapy and 30 percent in the ultrafiltration therapy group other clinical parameters like history of atrial fibrillation or flutter the history of diabetes medication use prior hospitalization for the heart failure in the previous year was fairly matched in the two groups the level of biomarkers like anti pro BNP was also fairly matched and the rise in creatinine was also fairly matched at the initiation of the study 188 patients were randomized in two different groups equally 94 patients were enrolled allocated to the pharmacological therapy group and 94 patients were allocated to the ultrafiltration group out of the 94 patients in the UF group 8 patients did not receive the allocated intervention and the reasons were because one patient withdrew the consent 4 patients were removed from the study based on physician's decision and 3 other were removed from the group because of serious adverse events or central and access issues or infusion pressure issues the primary analysis was done on day 4 and at the time of primary analysis 94 patients were analyzed in the pharmacologic therapy group and 92 patients were analyzed in the ultrafiltration group at day 60 four patients lost follow-up from the diuretic group and two patients lost to follow-up in the ultrafiltration group As I mentioned earlier, the primary outcome was displayed as a composite of weight loss and rise in serum creatinine. The red circle denotes the patients in the ultrafiltration group and the blue circle denotes the patients in the pharmacological therapy group. If we pay attention to the figure on the right, the 95% confidence region for the mean treatment at 96 hours is displayed here the x axis displays weight either it could be weight gain or weight loss the y axis axis denotes creatinine the creatinine could be lowered or it could have gone up the 95 per conf person confidence interval for the rise in creatinine achieved statistical significance but the 95% confidence region for the weight loss or weight gain did not achieve statistical, statistical significance. If you look at the visual scale on the other side, you can see that the weight loss was almost similar in the two group, but the rise in creatinine was slightly more in the ultrafiltration group as opposed to the pharmacological therapy group. At 96 hours, the mean change in serum creatinine level from the level measured at the time of randomization was a decrease of 0 0.04 plus or minus 0 0.5 milligrams per deciliter in the pharmacologic therapy group as compared with an increase of 0 0.23 plus or minus 0 0.70 milligrams per deciliter in the ultrafiltration group. And this this difference was statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.003 the change in the serum creatinine from baseline level 
with that at 48 hours 72 hours and 96 hours and 60 days differed significantly between the patients in the pharmacologic therapy group and those in the ultrafiltration group and that is displayed in this figure however there was no significant difference between the treatment group at the time of discharge or on day 7 whichever occurred first or at the 30 day assessment so at 48 hours 72 hours and at 60 days the drop in serum creatinine in the pharmacological drip therapy group achieved statistical significance but at 7 days and at 30 days that difference was not statistically significant as regards the body weight the loss weight loss was fairly similar Visually, it appears that in the first 72 hours, the ultrafiltration group had a slightly higher weight loss, but all these values were not statistically significant, even at 60 days or 30 days or at the time of discharge, which is probably 7 days. The amount of fluid removed in each group is displayed here. The red bar denotes fluid removed in form of urine and the blue bar denotes fluid removed in form of ultrafiltrate. In the pharmacologic therapy group is displayed on the left and the ultrafiltration group is displayed on the right. So if we see there was a lead time of 8 hours for the pharmacologic therapy because it took a median of 8 hours for the ultrafiltration group to initiate the ultrafiltration. So in the first 24 hours we usually do not see a major major difference. At, 20, at, two hour, at 2 days there was a statistically slight benefit to ultrafiltrate in terms of fluid removal although the desired level of fluid was still not removed as planned. At day 3 and day 4, in fact, more fluid came out in the pharmacologic therapy group, but not statistically significant. If you look at the mortality rate, the mortality rate at 60 days looks visually different here, but not statistically different. It was slightly higher in the ultrafiltration group, again, more so visually and less so significant statistically. The rates of rehospitalization or heart f uh, or time to death was also similar in the two groups, uh, slightly higher in the first few days in the ultrafiltration group, but not statistically significant different. The time to death or any rehospitalization also appeared visually higher in the ultrafiltration group, but it was not statistically significant. These are all the secondary endpoints uh, displayed here. The significant body weight loss and renal improvement at 96 hours or at 7 days was slightly higher in the pharmacologic therapy group as opposed to ultrafiltration group but not statistically significant. Same thing, worsening condition or crossover during the first day was 18% in the pharmacologic therapy group and 23% in the ultrafiltration group, not statistically significant. Uh, clinical decongestion was also not significantly different but look at the number of patients who actually got clinically significant decongestion only 9% in the pharmacology group and only 10% in the ultrafiltration group so the overall goal that we are looking for was still not achieved the change in sodium was more towards positive side in the pharmacologic therapy and the towards negative towards the negative side on the ultrafiltration therapy the change in GFR was on the better side in the pharmacologic therapy group and remained stable on the ultrafiltration group but not statistically significant. And again the rate of hospitalization, death, net fluid loss was also not statistically dif different in the two groups. The unscheduled emergency department or clinic visits was also similar in the two groups. 
the serious adverse events were slightly more in the ultrafiltration group and more so were infectious complications like sepsis, bacteremia or cellulitis, pneumonia and other respiratory disorders were more in the ultrafiltration group. Electrolyte disorders were actually more in the pharmacologic therapy group. Other cardiovascular disorders were almost similar. Heart failure rates were almost similar in the two groups. So the overall study inference is step pharmacologic therapy algorithm was superior to the ultrafiltration for preservation of renal function. The amount of weight loss at 96 hours was similar in the two approaches. That the population who got clinically significant decongestion at 96 hours was very small in both the groups and there was no statistically significant difference in rates of rehospitalization in the two groups. Was a rate of 200 milliliters per hour too much? Uh, in the previous smaller studies, when the ultrafiltration was done at this rate, the intravascular volume remained stable throughout the entire duration of the procedure, which indicates that a proportional volume of fluid was refilled back into the intravascular space from congested parenchyma when the fluid rate when the ultrafiltration rate was kept at 200 milliliters per hour. So at least we have some evidence in the literature that this much of a rate of ultrafiltration was not too detrimental. In the previous studies there was a similar but, stud but a smaller study done on a few patients. Ultrafiltration group had 17 patients and diuretics group had 19 patients all those patients had NYHA class 3 or 4 heart failure. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure was more than 20 centimeters of water. EF was less than 40 percent and the mean age was 60 years and mean GFR was 55. The primary endpoint of this study was time to achieve decongestion in form of reduced reduction in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure to a level of eight less than or equal to 18 centimeters of water for four consecutive hours and the secondary endpoints were the levels of cytokines, neurohormones and other clinical parameters. It's not a clinically well relevant study but it's all based on markers. UF group reached primary endpoints early with some statistical significance. In the ultrafiltration group there was a greater weight loss, greater volume removed and shorter length of stay but there was no difference in overall adverse events between the two groups. This was a smaller study done at the same time with this big study was getting ready to be published. Ultrafiltration had shown to have better weight loss in previous studies. This was a study done on 72 patients with a mean age of 61 years. Um, baseline GFR was 38. Ultrafiltration led to better weight loss but there was a 43% patient had a more than 20% reduction in GFR. 10% of these patients required HD and 13% of these patients got heart transplant LVED or they died or they were discharged to hospice. There were studies done on slow continuous ultrafiltration or SCUF. 63 patients with advanced heart failure. This study was done in a single center and the duration of SCUF was 48 hours. With SCUF there was higher weight loss and better hemodynamic parameters like CVP and pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. But 59% of those patients ended up in HD while in the hospital. 14% of those patients were on HD on discharge. 30% of the patients died and 6% of the patients ended up in hospice. The UNLOAD trial which was a hallmark study in 2007 was done very well done study on 200 patients. The ultrafiltration rate was around 241 milliliters per hour but look at the duration. The duration was 12 plus or minus 12 hours so the duration was shorter than the current study that we discussed today. In the diuretic, IV diuretics group, it was not a stepped up pharmacologic therapy, but the daily dosing was 181 plus or minus 121 milligrams. The patient age was 63 plus or minus 15 years. 69 percent of those patients were male. 71 percent of the patients had EF less than or equal to 40 percent. 
at 48 hours the weight loss was more in the ultrafiltration group with a statistically significant value net fluid loss was also more in the ultrafiltration group the overall dyspnea scores were similar at 90 days the rate of rehospitalization was lesser in in the ultrafiltration group there was no difference in serum creatinine between the two groups nine deaths occurred in the ultrafiltration group and 11 deaths occurred in the diuretics group so this study favored the use of ultrafiltration more so for more fluid loss and weight loss and reduction in the rate of rehospitalization again the duration is crucial here the duration of ultrafiltration was barely 24 hours so after referring to all these studies the questions that are raised is is there a, is transient worsening of renal function detrimental in long term the answer is yes because there are multiple studies which has shown adverse renal outcomes or you or or long-term renal replacement therapy needs in patients who had transient renal function worsening during the therapy of heart failure. What is the optimal duration and dosing of ultrafiltration? We still need to get that answer. The studies which were done on shorter duration had favorable outcomes in terms of fluid loss and rates of rehospitalization, but no change in the creatinine. The study which tried to take the ultrafiltration slightly longer did not show any difference in the outcome but in fact was slight worsening in the creatinine that is the current study what patient population benefits the most out of ultrafiltration so far we don't have the exact right answer but I at this point we are inclined to use ultrafiltration for those patients who are diuretic resistant true diuretic resistant after trying the stepped up pharmacological therapy and those patients who have acute decomposited heart failure. Is there an optimal way to combine diuretics and ultrafiltration for best therapeutic outcome? There should be one, but we are tr still we have still not reached a point to base or bring or to to come to any conclusions about this optimal use of ultrafiltration and diuretics combination. As more studies will undertake, we can be better define the right patient population to use UF and the right duration, right amount, right dose, and right combination of ultrafiltration and diuretics. Thank you.